Salutations! Welcome back to the We Tanks How to Mod series. If that message at the beginning didn't make it evident, you should probably watch episode 1 before continuing on with this series. Here's a card that'll take you right to it, and I'll also provide a link in the description as well. For the second episode of the series, we will talk solely about the common dot cart file. We will talk about the different parts of the minigame that the common dot cart file applies to, discuss in detail how each of these elements work, and how we can perform our custom edits to each of them. There's a lot to talk about with the common dot cart file, so let's get started. To begin, we should probably go through how we can access the subfiles that are contained within the common dot cart file. You see, it's helpful to think of the common dot cart as more of a compressed folder than as a singular file. Think of it as Nintendo's version of a zipped file. As such, we need to get the files contained within out before we can begin to think about modifying them. Now, you can use Brawlbox, or Brawlcate in this case, to access these internal files. You can even export and or import them at will, so this seems like the right program to use, right? Well, yes and no. While I acknowledge that this is something that seems easy and logical to do, I will counter by saying that Brawlbuck Box doesn't always like to import or export things correctly. Plus, if you need to make modifications to many files at once, doing so this way compounds the amount of work that needs to be done to achieve the proper result. Thusly, I choose to instead use Wimis SZS Toolset. Specifically, I use the WSZST command. In order to extract the files from the common.cart file, I use this command here. If we apply this to the common.cart file, we can see that after proper execution, we end up with a common.d folder. This folder contains all the extracted files that were present in the common.cart file. Here, we can perform our edits to, on each of the individual files, and when we need to create the modified common.cart, we can use this command. And once we run this command, we will end up with the proper file for use in the mod. Now, it is called common.szs, but that is okay. If you wish to, you can rename the extension to .cart for consistency, but that is not strictly required here. To test our common.cart file, we need to replace our the Wii Tanks common.cart in the extracted Wii Play disk folder. I suggest that you also make an ISO from the folder using Wimis ISO tools, specifically this command right here. But you don't have to, you can just run the main.dol using Dolphin Emulator, and that should achieve the same result. I'd recommend going with the latter if you have any concerns about disk space, since each ISO will take up over 4 gigabytes of space, which can quickly fill up your drive if you're not deleting them as you go. Also, before continuing on, I highly suggest you watch this video after having read this tank documentation sheet by the one and only The Goldfish King, since I'll be making a mention to it later on in this video and subsequent ones. Here's a link that'll allow you to read and download it. I'll also provide this link and every other subsequent one mentioned throughout this video in the description below. Starting with the G3D folder. This folder is the source of every physical 3D model you see present in the tanks minigame. Here's a list of all the programs you will be using to modify this aspect of the minigame. Here you can see that the names of each file give a very good idea of what models we expect to find within each one. Just to get it out of the way, the scene file file doesn't contain any models. It only contains info on certain graphical aspects of the minigame, mainly lighting and camera settings. As you can see, each file uses the BRRES format. For our purposes, Brawl Crate works great for these files. Although, do be warned, it doesn't handle everything perfectly well. But, you know, you just sometimes have to expect that. Now, as for how we are going to change these files, we first need to come up with some 3D models to use in place of the old ones. So we need to come up with some ideas on what kind of tanks we want. Here's a little insight from my mod, We Tanks Christmas Edition, on how I came up with the ideas for my tanks. First, I need to come up with sort of tank ideas. And obviously, whoops, this is winter theme, so I'll... Whoops, I'm going to want to think of some, uh, some s winter things. I'm already thinking maybe I'll make the brown tank a snowman tank, because they'll be stationary and all that. 
Hmm, I think I might want to make the black tank a s Santa. Whoops. Santa imposter. I think that's how you spell imposter. It doesn't really matter. I definitely want to have a reindeer tank. Um, it should be kind of like ones that move fast and all that. I'm going to be modifying the uh, the actual model files too, so. I might make a frost tank. I think I'll make the green tank a frost, or an, an ice tank. It'll also be stationary, so. I, I kind of want to keep it kind of like the same, just unless you want to kind of get out there and really try some fancy things. I already got a reindeer tank. I'm, by the way, I'm going to make mine's uh, presents, so uh, now that's what I'm going to use that for, so. Although, I could make one the present tank, and that could be the yellow tank that lays a bunch of presents. That could also work for the Santa tank, though, because Santa gives out presents. Mm, I'll, I'll start here. Uh, if I don't think of anything else, I'll make this the present. I think, let's see, how do you spell present? Ooh, I'm going to make the candy cane tank. Um, let's see. Should I make it the pink tank, maybe? I'll leave it at the pink tank for now. Order doesn't really matter so much. I'm going to make it the marine tank. He'll fire the fast bullets. Oh, I, I was going to make an elf tank. Um, the elf tank should move fast because it's going to be a small tank. I'm going to make it a little smaller. I'll make, I'm going to make the white tank, uh, the, a bomb, maybe abominable snowman, eh. Isn't there like a yeti tank, or, or sorry, a yeti? What's a yeti again? Yeah, yeti, um, I'll make the white tank the yeti tank. The white tank will be, uh, a yeti tank, and the yeti tank will be bigger than all the other tanks. Maybe I should switch the reindeer and the white tank. Or, sorry, the the reindeer and the yeti tank. I mean, I'm not exactly sure this is exactly how I want to keep it. There's some that I absolutely definitely want to keep. I think the black tank should be the Santa imposter tank. So, but, um, I'll just write it down here. The elf tank. Now I've got one left. This might not be so traditional what I'm going to get here, but maybe I'll find a pathway to some some awesome idea or something like that. You never know. Could make could make a mistletoe tank, gingerbread tank. That people might confuse that with the reindeer tank. They'll both be brown. So I'm thinking about all the different Christmas things I've ever seen. Maybe there's something they'll pop out. I could just call it the Santa tank. I'm not sure what exactly I'm going to call it, but I know exactly what I want it to look like. So. Uh, I don't really want to make a snow tank because I already have an ice tank, so that kind of solves that. I'm going to make sure to put icicles on the model. <laughs> I mean, that gingerbread tank's kind of kind of sticking out more and more. Again, though, I don't know how exactly I'm going to make it. I, a tree tank? Nah. Maybe a mistletoe tank. Like, I could add a little... A little texture of mistletoe or something like that. Color it green. How many green objects would I have? The elf tank would be part green. Present tank, I could make any color, really. Yeah, I guess I don't really have enough... Or li literally any green. Um, yeah, in that case, I'll make it the... Mm, make sure I spell this right. Oh, it's holly. Okay, I'll call it the holly tank, then. All right. So there's our tanks list. I'm not concerned at this point exactly what their special abilities are going to be and all that. Just coming up with ideas. Once you have a general idea on the kinds of tanks you want in the game, you now need to bring them from concept to reality. For this, I like to use SketchUp, just because I've been using it for 8 years at this point. But any modeler of your choice should do, just so long as you can still import it into Blender. That'll be important later. If you want to work within the confines of the original models, you can simply export them from the respective res file using Brawl Crate. 
make sure to export it in a .dae file, since it is more compatible with other programs than the MDL0 type. Once you have finished designing all of the models you wish to use, you now need to export them from your modeler program into Blender. Now, just quickly going to mention here, you don't have to use two separate programs here, since Blender does allow you to edit your models from within. So, if your main modeler program is Blender, then kudos to you. Anyways, once we have our model in Blender, we are going to need to specify a few parameters before we import our final DAE into Brawlcrate. For my purposes, I just imported the original DAE from Brawlcrate into Blender and replaced the mesh with my own mesh I designed, and then simply set the vertices to be controlled by the proper bones. I'd recommend doing it this way just so you can keep the bones and material shaders intact. Some aspects of the model that we can specify here in Blender are bones, materials, vertices, normals, UVs, colors, objects, and textures. Side note, by colors they are referring to something called vertex colors. It's a little complicated to explain, but here's just a few examples on what you can achieve with proper vertex coloring. After we have specified our parameters, we can now export our final model to a DAE and can now go into Brawl Crate and take our desired 3D model and replace it with the DAE we just created. Now, you'll probably notice that our model doesn't look like it's shaded properly. That's just because when we replace the model, we also replace the shader with the one that was used in Blender, which unfortunately doesn't work quite so well on the Wii. So we'll need to make some changes to the shaders in Brawl Crate to make it look right. Now, if you want to make this really easy, you can simply export the old shader and use it to replace the new shader with the old one. I mean, it's what I did, and my tanks turned out not so bad, so... Now, if this seems a little bit loose-ended, that is because it unfortunately kind of is. You see, I'm not an expert on the BRRES format, and I certainly can't tell you what all of these options do. So I'd suggest that you take a look at this video that goes a bit more in depth about the whole model editing process for Brawl Crate. This video should help you avoid many of the long and never ending issues I encountered trying to get my models looking right and proper in the game. So that'll be good for you. And before we move on to the next aspect of the common.cart file, I want to quickly mention that when it comes to the mine, you don't want to remove the original dome mine from the model file. This is because the mine explosion actually uses the domed mine for rendering the fireball. The game just uses the specific mesh, changes the texture, and scales it up in size when the mine explodes. So to say that when I replaced the mine with my little present model, I ended up with a more squarish explosion. So yeah, don't do that. Keep the old dome mine there. Just make sure your new model is bigger and have it envelop the old domed mine and everything should turn out hunky dory. Next we move on to the map data folder. This folder contains the map data that we tanks uses to determine the layout of each mission in the game. Here's a list of all the programs we will be using to modify this aspect of the minigame. As you can see, unlike the mall editing aspect before, map editing is quite easy and accessible to many people due to the lack of complexity and reduced number of required programs. Blitzkrieg Tools Map Editor, called Blitzkrieg Cartography, is the only program we need to make any change we want to the maps. Simply create the map of your desires, and then save it to the appropriate file in the map data folder. It's as simple as that. What I'll be explicitly discussing here is how you can design a map that will not only be practical to play, but also look pleasant. Here's a little video on how I designed one of the maps in my mod, We Tanks Christmas Edition. But in order to truly make this kind of, you know, our own, we need to design maps. When it comes to actually designing maps, and by the way, this can't go any bigger, it's a fixed size. When it actually comes to designing maps, uh, Symmetry is going to be your friend. I would have to say if there's three rules, three golden rules when it comes to designing good maps. Again, just... I shouldn't say rules, they're more guidelines. Um, but the three guidelines I would say is symmetry is king, keep it simple, and avoid kind of illusions, so to say. And if you guys, any of you have watched my tank box review, 
it was a video that I reviewed uh, Tank Box or Tank Box, which is a tanks remake game. I kind of mentioned the maps and mentioned those same three guidelines. Those three guidelines apply here, and they've applied to pretty much all the maps I've designed. So uh, there's also kind of a bunch of other, you know, like little things you can have. You can have a more center-minded map where the blocks are more on the outskirts and the open, the, the center's pretty open. You can have a more maze-style enclosed one where the center is taken up by blocks and uh, you have little quadrants or something like that, little spaces to the side. You could have a combination. So, there's one that I, that I like to use occasionally and that's kind of like what I like to call a symbol map, which is basically... Uh, take a symbol or something like that, like a dollar sign, and turn that into a map. Because that could be a map if you really wanted to. You could do the same with a number, like you could have the number 69 as a map if you wanted to. So those are what I like to call symbol maps. Um, but one thing I like to do is vary it up. Um, kind of give each map its own little feeling. Because if you do that, then it'll be a lot easier for people to remember them. They'll stick in their minds. You'll say, oh yeah, I remember that map. You'll have the layout kind of easily memorized. You won't have to, you know, if you have two similar maps, then the problem becomes people having to say, oh, which map was that for again? Was that 16 or 19? They're pretty similar. So uh, I try and avoid that. Again, just guidelines. You, If you want to build, like, a map that has the craziest balls to the wall thing, then go ahead and do it. Um, this is just the way I design maps, and as far as I'm concerned, they seem to work out pretty well. I get, I get pretty good uh, replies for, uh, or pretty good responses to the maps I make. So, just saying. Anyways, I'm quickly going to go through. I've already been thinking of a few ideas on maps. Um, you, you kind of want to have an idea of, uh, some, some maps are more specially made, like, you might say, oh, this is the kind of tanks I want on this map, and this is how it's going to look. And you can do that, absolutely you can. One thing you have to be careful of, though, is what happens when you, uh, do possibly randomized ones. Because if that map that you specifically designed is included in one of those randomized maps, then there's the possibility you could get something that you never intended and could turn out to be way harder. Like I would say there's there's the two main ways you can increase difficulty is through the tanks and through the maps. And 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 actually when I say that out loud, basically I'm saying that basically what I'm referring to is that those are the only two things <laughs> that you can change the difficulty with. Like you can have some really hard tanks, but if the maps kind of give all the advantage to the player, then that helps bring the difficulty down quite a bit. And likewise, you could have some pretty easy tanks, but then put the player in a really bad situation and surround them from all angles with the tanks and all that, and the map makes it really hard. So, uh... And there's, there's a bit of a delicate uh, uh, balancing act here. So anyways, what I'm going to design first is the Mission 1, because... That's just where I'm going to start. And uh, one important thing you have to remember about the first mission map is that it always starts out with that little ribbon at the bottom that takes up like the lower portion. Whoops, this is the wrong one. I believe, is it this one? Yeah. So you see here, this the lower part of it's blocked off because normally on mission one you have this little thing here, so. And, uh, you don't have to worry about that if you don't want to, however, i found that if you're going to have a mission 1, you might as well make it unique from all the others and have that little space at the bottom, so that's what I'm going to be doing. So first things first, I'm going to start off with that, and what I'm going to do, I can right click this and then do it that way. now that's all good and don't worry about tile heights or block heights or anything yet we'll save that for the end so now let's see how do I want to go about this we could maybe we could do it every just the six here 
yeah, I like that. That works. And this, since this is the beginner map, or like a tutorial map, we don't have to do something so fancy. Uh, hmm. Something like that. Now, this is where it helps to have this, because then you can say, alright, for something like that's specifically designed, alright, there's going to be one brown tank, or maybe there'll be, okay, there's two pinks and two violets, so then we can uh, design the map more for that. Now, don't get in the habit, though, of doing that for every single map, because if you randomize, if you include those in randomized maps, and uh, they might give you something that you weren't intending that might make the game really hard, so just keep that in mind. In fact, actually, I think what I'm going to do for this to make it a little bit different is I'm actually going to do it this way. I'll leave two there, and then, yeah, I'll do it this way. And then I'll put you up here at the top. Or should I put you in the middle? If I put you in the middle, then... And this is just kind of the process that I go through. It's just like, okay, let's... Maybe this could work. Like, I... I, I there's very few instances where I already have it set out in my mind exactly what I'm going to do. So, just kind of tinker around a bit and see what tickles your fancy, so. So we could do that, and then we could put our single tank right there. And maybe we could put some holes on the corner. We can put two there, and two there. No, actually, they will go here. And this will work better in here, because it's in the direct center. If I move these back here, that gives you five here. We could put five there. Whoops. Just get rid of these. And it's a number two, so we can place two there. These ones don't matter so much because, like I said, I'm doing a uh, level 1 and it's going to be using a map ID that I'm not going to be using anywhere else. So, like I said, this is sort of a very specific map, so I don't have to worry so much about these other tanks. But I'll put them in spots nonetheless. I don't abstain myself from saying oh that must that tank must exactly go there I just kind of randomly place them around I yeah something like that again it doesn't really matter too much and then once you've gotten everything set up how you want you say all right this is good then you can change your block heights and I think I'll just this since this is the first one don't want things to be too tall. Let's make the four block the four block bu bunches just two blocks high and leave it at that. And there you go, there's your map. So uh and then here's where the map ID range comes in. You can say, alright, map ID one. So then we go file save as and we go to map tank data one dot bin right here. This is player one, make sure you get the player one one thing, right? And uh, the zero indicates that it's four by three and the one indicates that it's 16 by nine, so keep that in mind. So we'll save. And give it a second for it to save here. And there we go. So now we've uh, designed one map. Now, when it comes to arranging your maps, you'll need to correlate this directly with how you want your missions to be. As you can see here, I saved the map making aspect to near the end of my mod making experience, and I designed my maps according to the mission layout you see here. Now, you don't have to have a mission layout, but I'd highly recommend you do as it'll help plan out your mod's general feel beforehand, thus requiring you to not have to think about these missions on the fly while designing them. In general, it is just better to have most of your mod planned out before you begin executing the work. 
trust me, it'll make your modding life a lot more easier. And it'll also make your mod look a lot more polished and planned out, rather than a hodgepodge of tapped on ideas. Finally, I'd suggest you take care if you intend to make your map in both 16x9 and 4x3. For me, I design most of my maps in 16x9 first, then downscale them to 4x3. You aren't required to do it this way, but do make sure that you don't design this, your 16x9 version to be too complicated for a 4x3 aspect ratio. Also, just please, for the love of God, don't design maps like this. You see, the Wii handles these kinds of maps about as well as I do when I try to parallel park. Which is to say, slow and steady wins the race, right? Then we get to the param folder. This folder contains one singular file called tankgameparam.bin. This bin file contains all the information in regards to the parameters of the enemy tank AI and missions encountered in the game. In short, if you want to make most any changes to the tank's AI or the layout of the missions, it will be done here. Here's a list of all the programs we will be using to modify this aspect of the minigame. Like before with the map data folder, we only need one program to make changes to the file within. Blitzkrieg Tools' parameter editor called Blitzkrieg Technology. When we open up the file with Blitzkrieg Tools, we can see that it specifies the amount of starting lives, only for player 1 by the way, then then splits the rest of the file into two sections, one for tanks and one for missions. For most purposes, you'll want to make changes to the tank section first before you start messing around with the missions, so we'll be doing that here as well. Now, as for how to change the tank's parameters, there are quite a few things to change here, and unfortunately, most of it is either only vaguely known or completely unknown. And that's quite unfortunate, as it limits our options on what exactly we can meaningfully change about the tanks we encounter. But that all changes today, because after many, many attempts and tests that I did myself, I have taken down the 27 partly unknown or completely unknown values and reduced that number down to just 8. Even better is that while I may not know specifics about those 8 values, I can point them to a certain aspect of the tank's AI, meaning that it's not completely unknown which part of the tank they'll affect. I've taken all this knowledge and put it together to figure out how the AI works in Wii Tanks. And right here, right now, I'm going to show all of this to you as well. A little disclaimer here before I begin. I have not seen the game's internal code for how all this works. I am making my best educated guess on how the AI is coded, mainly from experience and the results I got from testing. So take what I say with a slight grain of salt. Anyways, disclaimer over. I will know you all be anxious to learn the truth behind Wee Tanks' biggest mystery, Wired Green Tanks so flipping good. So let's make haste and get on with the show. To begin, we need to understand the different elements that make up the tanks AI, and just so you know going forward, I will be going by the documentation and terminology listed by the Goldfish King in their tanks documentation file. There are a total of 42 words that define each tanks' parameters, and at first glance, it might seem like the way they are arranged doesn't make up any reasonable pattern, but after analyzing the order more thoroughly, I did determine that the way each word is ordered does follow a pattern. Mainly that words 2 to 10 relate solely to mine parameters, words 11 to 28 relate to movement and turning parameters, and words 29 to 42 relate to shooting and turret parameters. Word 1 is simply a special flag that determines whether the tank turns invisible, so it is classified differently from the other parameters. It makes sense that the words would be arranged this way. As a programmer, it's a good idea to keep similar values and properties close to each other to reduce complexity, and as you'll soon see, the purpose of each of these words will prove that this way of grouping is indeed what the programmer's intent was. So this is the big first step. We may not know exactly what each word does, but we can now be certain what each word is most likely to affect. And that alone is quite an important thing to learn for anyone who is interested in modding tanks. Now let's get into the nitty gritty and talk about each element of the tanks AI in detail and what words play an effect in that specific element. Let's begin with the simplest aspect first, the turret movement. The turret movement defines where the tank is currently aiming its turret. It utilizes words 29, 39, and 40. Let's now go over how the game's code uses these words. 
The game first begins by setting an initial target to the player's current position. Note, if there are two players, it sets the initial target to the closest player. The game then offsets this target away from the player using RNG, but it will always remain within the target location max angle value, also known as Word 29. This Word 29 is why some tanks will try to aim around the player, while others aim directly at the player. A low value will keep the turret close in line with the player, while a higher value will allow the turret to overextend the player's position. After an offset of target has been set, the turret will start to rotate towards the target. It will use Word 39 to determine how fast the turret will rotate. Once the turret has reached its target, it will simply stay there until it's been given a new target. A new target is given each time the number of frames elapsed from the last set target has met the value listed in Word 40. This so-called target timer determines how often the target will refresh. And that is really it. Just three words to determine all of this. Quite remarkable if you ask me. Here are a few examples of what some different values can lead to. Now that we've determined how the tanks are programmed to aim, let's now determine what makes them shoot. The shooting algorithm utilizes these words listed here. Of these words, I'm currently unsure of word, what word 31 is for, so I'll leave it out of the equation for these instances. First, we must start by taking the current angle of our turret and drawing a line out from the end of the barrel towards the first wall we meet. We then create a detection zone for both the player and AI tanks. Words 32 and 33 specify the max angle of this range, similar to word 29 for the turret movement. Now, for most purposes, words 32 and 33 are the same, but for visual sake, they are made different here. When a player tank is inside their specified detection zone, the tank will be given the go-ahead to shoot. If, however, an AI tank is present in their detection zone, then the tank is abstained from ever shooting. That is, until the AI leaves the detection zone. Also, Word 41 acts similar to Word 32, except that it specifies a radius around the tank, rather than an angle. It acts the exact same as Word 32. If an AI tank is present within the zone, the tank won't shoot until the situation has been resolved. By the way, the ends of the detection zones are rounded off by taking the distance from the barrel to the wall, and using this length to cap off how far the detection zone goes. Also keep in mind that the number of ricochets plays a role in this shooting calculation as well, because these detection zone calculations are also performed on those ricochets as well, minus the AI detection radius, which only happens at the tank's current location. I must point out, however, that there is a limit to the number of calculations the game will do here. You see, while setting the ricochet count to 1 or 2 works fine, something odd happens when you set this to 3 and up. The game caps the calculation to only one ricochet. This essentially makes it a little bit stupid to set this number above 2, as the lack of calculations means that the game can't even calculate as good of shots as a tank that has 2. Also, this disjointed, this disjointed relationship between the calculations made for shooting a bullet versus the amount of ricochets the bullets actually make means that it becomes exponentially more likely that the tank will accidentally shoot himself or one of his friends, because it cannot calculate the extra ricochets that it needed to know if it was actually going to hit itself. And before you ask, no, I don't know what code causes this, nor how to get around it, TLDR, keep this number at 2 or below, and only set it above 2 for very, very special cases. Adding on to this, setting this value past multiples of 16 will change how the bullet looks, but it won't change how it sounds. It also has the added side effect of causing the tank to rarely shoot ever, so it's not exactly useful. That last reason in particular is why I don't really do it anymore, but maybe someone will have some good reason too. So here I am mentioning it. If you really wanted to change the bullet look and sound the right way, you'd have to make the changes in the main.dual and the tank sound file, which is something that is not currently known how to be properly done. Sad face. 
After the tank has the go ahead to fire some bullets, it will use these words here. Words 35, 36, and 37 all perform timer functions to determine how quickly the tank will fire. I'd like for you to take special note of words 35 and 36, however. These two values make up what I like to call the random timer boundaries. You'll see similar values being used for mines and tank movement as well. Essentially, these two values specify a boundary that determines a range of frames from when the tank will shoot it. The game uses RNG to determine where in this range the tank will actually fire. Word 37 acts as a bit of a mandatory timer. Call it an auxiliary timer, if you will. From what I can best gather, this is how the game's timers work together to determine how quickly a tank will shoot. The tank will normally only shoot in the yellow region you see here, but some circumstances will actually negate the random timers and use solely word 37 to determine how long to wait. I can't provide exact details on what the circumstances cause this, but they do happen, so just be aware of that. The shooting algorithm along with the turret movement algorithm work together to give the tank the ability to aim the turret, calculate when to and when not to shoot, and how long to wait before being able to shoot. With this little bit of knowledge, we can now solve the mystery as to why green tanks are supercomputers. The answer? Well, I hate to spoil it to you, but they actually aren't that special. There is no deep learning or adaptive AI working here. The green tank is simply aiming about randomly, hoping that the player tank will enter its detection zone, then hoping that when it shoots, it will connect a shot onto the player. It's actually a bit disappointing that it really is that simple. However, I do have another explanation for why green tanks are still so feared even to this day, and it really boils down to three main points. 1. they are two ricochet bullets. While their AI might seem simple and that they don't explicitly lead their shots, their two ricochet bullets do allow them quite a bit more access points than if they only had one ricochet shot. And they will still calculate a shot that will land somewhere near you. It just so happens that whether they lead or lag you is often a matter of chance. And if you play your cards right, you'll easily be able to predict their shots. Two. Fast bullet speed and perfect value combo. It seems obvious. Why would the green tanks need to lead their shots if their bullets go so fast that they don't need to worry about the player tank running away in time? This fast bullet speed along with their near perfect dialed in detection zone means that when shots are made that would not be direct hits, they still have a good chance that the bullet might end up on the right path for the player tank to be in the way. Hence, the idea that they are somehow supercomputers. And 3. Human Perception This for me is the biggest reason why greens are so feared. You see, we play, and by extension tanks, came out in 2006-2007. Many of us were still quite young back then, and we didn't know the first thing about trigonometry or angles or the like. So when our little selves got destroyed by these little green monsters, we started to remember them, not as pushovers, but as gods of calculation. And while many of us would be way better at avoiding green tanks today, that little experience we got when we were young has remained with us ever since. It left a lasting impression. We will warn others of the horrors of the green tank, and as long as we do, the green tank will continue to reign supreme. Ah, now where were we? Oh yes, the tank's AI. I'll now cover the other main element of the tank's AI, mainly the movement process. The tank AI movement process utilizes these words here. Of these words, I am unfamiliar with words 20, 24, and 25, so I'll again leave them out of this. Now, unlike the shooting and turret algorithm before, I don't really have the process nailed down here. So instead, I'm going to just list what each word affects when it comes to movement and leave it at that. Starting with words 11 and 12, they specify the acceleration and deceleration, in that order, of the tank. Pretty simple, no further explanation needed. Word 13 describes the maximum angle that the tank can randomly turn to when following the path. You see, when the tank determines that it wants to turn, determined by the random timer boundary, aka words 14 and 15 coming up here, 
it will use word 13 to determine what the max angle of this turn can be. Essentially, it operates the same as how word 29, 32, or 33 does. Words 14 and 15 are, as previously described, the random timer boundary values for tank movement and require no further explanation. Words 16 to 19 have to deal with awareness of objects. To break it down further, 16 deals with AI tank mines, 17 with AI tank bullets, 18 with player tank mines, and 19 with player tank bullets. When one of these objects gets within the tank's specific radius value, the tank will enter survival mode, during which the tank will neglect to fire bullets and try to run away from the threat as quickly as possible. If two threats are within the radius at the same time, the tank will give priority to the one that is closest to it. Word 21 determines the aggressiveness of the tank. Negative values will cause the tank to avoid the player, and will essentially push the tank out to the corners of the map whereas positive values will cause the tank to try and get closer to the player tank. Nothing much else to note here. Word 22 is what I like to call the turning divisor. Essentially, when the tank has to make an abrupt turn, which happens when it comes into contact with a wall for a period equal to the range in words 14 slash 15, it will try and split up this turn into a certain number of mini turns, rather than one big turn. The turning divisor determines how many times this abrupt turn, which will always be 80 degrees by the way, is split up. See this example here. When set to 1, the tank can only make one big turn at an 80 degree angle. If this value is set to 6 instead, the tank will instead choose to make 6 13 degree turns. And that's really all it does, although I should warn you, don't set this value above 10, because if you do, well, let's just say that the tanks will get really pissed off and delete themselves from existence. The last few words are pretty self-evident. Word 23 is the maximum speed that the tank can move. Word 26 is the maximum speed that the tank can turn. Word 27 defines the maximum turn angle that a tank can make without having to stop and pivot. And word 28 specifies how far away tanks will remain from touching any wall slash obstacle. Although, this doesn't affect a tank that is in survival mode, keep that in mind. And that is really it for the movement process for the tank's AI. But don't worry about those words I'm neglecting to mention, I'll get to them at the end here. And finally, the last and least known aspect of the tank's AI, the mine lane process. Unfortunately, this part of the tank's AI seems to be the hardest to figure out, and a lot of it I've had trouble figuring out. Like the movement process, I can't figure out how the mine lane process works in a nice and organized way. So I'm again going to have to do this like before and simply tell you what each word does and leave the rest up to you. I'll start with word 3, which simply lists the maximum number of mines that the tank may have on the screen at once. Do note that the game does have a hard limit on the total number of mines that may be had on the screen at once, 16 to be exact. If 16 mines are on the screen at once and the tank tries to lay another one, it will not work. Words 4 and 5 act as the random timer boundary values for mine laying, so no further inquiry to be made there. Word 9 is an auxiliary cooldown timer and acts similar to word 37. Recall that word 37 acts as a bit of a mandatory timer and is allotted with words 35 and 36. Likewise, Word 9 works in the same routine with Words 4 and 5, so as long as you understand what Word 37 does, you'll know what Word 9 does as well. Finally, Word 10 is in the Mobility Timer. When laying a mine, a tank will remain immobile, unable to move, for a certain period of time. Word 10 describes how long this time is in frames. Word 42 does the same thing, only for shooting bullets, rather than mine laying. And, unfortunately, that's all I've been able to nail down about the mine lane process. Even worse is the fact that most of this is already sort of known, apart from the confirming that words 4 and 5 are timer boundaries of some sort, the rest was already known beforehand. However, I do have some ideas on what the other values would be for, and that's what I'm quickly going to do here. I'll be providing my two cents on what the remaining words might be for. For mine lane, words 2, 6, and 7 are all likely to do with radiuses and maximum angles of some sort. 
I say this because of the fact that all the values in these words are of floating point type. Floating point values are typically associated with elements that often deal with non-integer variances. Simulations often deal with such values. Other such examples in our case include radius values, angle values, and position values. On the contrary, integer values, examples include signed and unsigned 32-bit integers, are all used in instances where exact non-fractional values are of paramount importance. Such examples are putting the cap on the maximum bullets slash mines slash lives, frame counting, frame timers, etc. It wouldn't make any sense to have 3.4 or 5 and a quarter for any of these previously mentioned examples. So signed slash unsigned integers are used instead. Continuing on to movement parameters, word 20 is likely some sort of boolean flag, since the value is either 0 or 1 for all of the tanks. I can't be exactly sure what the boolean is for though. But it is 1 for ash, marine, pink, yellow, and white tanks, and 0 for brown, violet, green, and black tanks. So take that how you will. I couldn't discern any pattern for why it's 1 or 0 for certain tanks, but maybe someone will know something I didn't. Words 24 and 25 are a bit more mysterious. They are treated as floating point numbers, so they likely have nothing to do with timers. It's possible it could be for radius values, but I can't be sure. They seem to be a little too small for such purposes. It also doesn't help that the values are the same for all nine enemy tanks. Compounding to the mystery, Gold the Goldfish King says that word 25, quote, seems to affect tank speed. Tanks get slower the farther from 0 0.85. Now, weirdly enough, I couldn't replicate this result no matter what I changed it to, so I honestly have no clue anymore. If anyone else watching this has any ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Our last unknown word pertains to shooting and turret parameters, word 31. Like words 24 and 25, I can't say with what I'm about to with confidence, but I'm itching that word 31 has something to do with angles, since it is first and foremost a floating point number, so no timers or counters, and second that it is by default too low to make any meaningful difference as a radius value. If it is an angle value, I'm still unsure about what exactly it would be doing, since it's the same for all 9 enemy tanks. And it's pretty tight, even for angles. So yeah, if anyone else has any ideas or tests of their own to provide the explanation, once again, I implore you to post them in the comments below. We will all be grateful. And with that, we are finished explaining the tank's AI to the best of my current abilities. Now, I expect that as time goes on and people learn more about Wii Tanks and its processes, we will learn more about these words and how exactly the game uses them. To that end, I will provide a link in the description that will give you all a document that will briefly explain what each of the words are for and what they are likely to do when set to certain values. I suggest that anyone who is interested in Wii Tanks modding use this document to help them in their modding endeavors. And it won't be a one-time post either. I'll be constantly updating the document with new information whenever I catch wind of it. So always be sure to check in and see if any new info has been included in the document. And before we move on to the second part of the parameter file, the mission side of things, here's a little clip that shows me coming up with the values that I used for one of the tanks used in the Wii Tanks Christmas Edition mod. Alright, so now it's going to be time to come up with some new tank parameters. This is probably one of, apart from uh, changing the uh, actual levels, one of the most important things that you're going to want to be doing for uh, making your tanks mods. So uh, I'm using Blitzkrieg tools, as you can see, and I'm going to quickly pull up under my documents my tanks list. What we're going to be doing is kind of refining this a bit. As you can see, I defined kind of the bullets and the mines and just general movement ideas. And uh, But now, when we're actually editing these values, we're going to get specific. 
So first of all, just general stats, we want to have one bullet, one ricochet, zero mines, and no movement, so not really too many changes to be made to the brown tag, but when we get to specifics, this is where my change is going to be. Now, like I said, I haven't really thought too much about this, I kind of like to think of things on the spot, so I kind of want this to be possibly, maybe I should do that for the green tag though. No mines, so not changing this, can't change world word 2, that's mines. See, I don't know what 24 does. I do know what 28 is, though. Yeah, specifies how far ta away tanks remain from touching a wall. That's movement, so it doesn't really matter. This has to do with, basically, aiming. So, angle offset can be offset from it. So, it's basically, will the tank lead shots or not? That's kind of a short answer to it. If I make it 90 degrees, I don't think it should really go any further than 90. 90 degrees means basically here that the tank will only aim as far away as 90 degrees from you so any further than that then it's basically shooting behind you which is a bit of a problem so at least for this tank um maybe for the green tank i'll make it more like 180 so that way it can see shots that it couldn't otherwise make it a bit different there 31 is unknown it's always been five so like, uh, the values that I don't know kind of don't tend to change much, so... Uh, one thing I'm quite aware of is in the original, you know, tank shielding was a thing. Because basically, if there was an enemy tank right by you, um, that the that the other tank was aiming at you, it wouldn't shoot at you because, because of this value right here, basically. Because it's the same as the player value, if, if there's an enemy tank that's basically right next to the player tank... It won't shoot at him so I think maybe I'll make this five at least that way so that um, if there's an AI tank within five degrees it'll be it won't shoot but if there's a player tank in 20 then it will shoot it's a possibility that a player tank can use this to kind of aim at another tank and push them into the other one I'm not concerned about that too much right now. I'd rather have a tank shoot at you than not shoot at you. I think I'm going to make this 30. Turning parameters don't matter, and everything else looks pretty alright. I'm actually going to make his bullets a little faster. And I'll make shot cooldown 10, actually. So, same here. These have to do with whether they shoot, and it's mostly just timer-related stuff. So let's keep it around something like that. Stun time doesn't matter because we're not moving. And lastly is turret speed. And this will kind of affect the majority of how your tank aims. I could have the turret move a bit slower but then make this a bit longer. Let's make this 120 and then let's make this 0 0.075. At this point, these are just rough values. We can always, we're going to be play testing this to make sure that, you know, these tanks actually kind of feel like how they, how I want them to. You should always play test your mod to make sure that it's what you want. And that looks good for the brown tank, or as I call it now, the snowman tank. And basically we're going to do the same to the rest of these tanks and just modify these values. So I'm just going to record myself, stop talking and just kind of get to work on doing that. Now let's move on to section 2 of the parameter file. The second section is all about the missions that are used in the game. You can specify which mission to modify, which maps will be used for that mission, what tanks will appear on said mission, and whether said mission will reward an extra life for its completion. It will also allow you to do this for two player missions as well. And that is really it. You can do this for all 100 missions, unfortunately you can't add more, although two player is capped at 20 missions. Funnily enough, this allows us to do something pretty cool. Now, normally there are only 30 maps dedicated for one player, with 16x9 and 4x3 versions for each. This normally means we can't have any more than 30 unique maps. But here's the catch. Two player also has 30 unique maps, even though two player only has 20 missions. This means that 10 of those maps aren't used in normal gameplay. Now the interesting thing about the single player's map ID in Blitzkrieg technology is that when we set it to 30 and above, the single player maps will start to overflow into the two player maps. 
Examples include Map ID 30 in single player is Map 0 for 2 player, Map ID 37 in single player is Map 7 for 2 player, and Map ID 43 in single player is Map 13 for 2 player. When the game in single player tries to load a two player map, the player tank will always be placed at the blue tank position, and nothing else will change. So doing this, we could conceivably have up to 60 unique maps for single player. This does come with some catches however. If the game in two player tries to load a single player map, the second player will be placed at the exact center of the map, even if there is a wall there. This could conceivably cause some problems, so if you have a map that you intend to use for both 1 player and 2 player, make sure you design it to work with both of them. By the way, overflowing the map ID past 2 player maps will only lead to blank maps, so don't do that. Finally, before moving on, as I mentioned before, I would recommend you save the mission parameters for last. For most purposes, you best figure it out after you've created all of your tanks and made all of your maps. If you don't do this, you may end up having to change missions if you end up e making even slight changes to the tanks or maps later on. So just take it from me, save it from last. Oh, and also, creating a list beforehand of your missions isn't such a bad idea either. You know, just something to think about. Oof, that was quite a doozy, wasn't it? Luckily, the last two parts of the common.cart file aren't as complicated to explain. The tank underscore footmark folder contains the tread marks that each tank uses in the game. To edit these, we will need Wimus SCS toolset, specifically the WIMGT command, and an image editor of your choice. Now, I originally intended to use Wexel's toolbox to modify these. I mean, it's what I used to make the treads disappear for Wii Tanks Master, so it should work here, right? Well, no. I later found out that while it technically does read .bti files, the file type the tank treads use, it doesn't read them, well, correctly. And when it saves the file, it saves it in the completely wrong format, despite the program claiming it to be a proper BTI file. So I instead decided to go with Wimus SCS Toolset. You see, Wimus SCS Toolset has a command, the WIMGT command. That is able to convert the BTI file to a more standard image format, mainly a PNG file. And once we do that with this command here, we will end up with a PNG equivalent of the file we need to modify. Now all we need to do is open up the PNG with the image editor of our choice, in this case Adobe Photoshop, make the edits to the file, save the PNG file, and then use the WINGT command once again with this line here to convert the modified PNG back to the BTI format. And that's all there is to it. Do note that you can't use color in these files since they are just meant to be an alpha slash opacity map and don't use the chrominance info for anything. And finally, the last element of the common dot cart that we can modify, the basic tank breath and basic tank breath to file, have to do with particles and effects. For the uninitiated, particles and effects are all of the flashy things that you see in the game that aren't models. So the smoke trail behind a bullet those are particles. The explosion bits of the tank, same with those. And the rubble that appears when you blow up a wall, all of that and more is done with these two files here. For these files, Brawl Crate is all we'll generally need, although I do suggest that for more heavy, in-depth modding, you keep your hex editor nearby, as it may prove handy here. Now, I'm going to be completely honest with you all here. I have the littlest of clues about everything that's done here. I can say that the breath t file contains all of the textures that the particles and effects use, and for this, using the replace button in Brawl Crate seems to work fine. But as for the actual effects file, the breath file, I'm a little lost when it comes to what exactly the process is. Most of what I learned comes from this wiki page that talks about the file format, and I highly suggest you read and understand this before going forward. Here's a link to check it out. Now, for my mod, We Tank Christmas Edition, I only made two changes to this file. I made the block explosion bits to be blue to match the new texture I gave the blocks, and I removed the tank parts that are used when the tank explodes. I did try to figure out what changes the color of these bits for each tank. I assumed it was these animation subfiles here that does that, but I was not able to determine which one, if any, was able to produce the effect that I wanted. 
Even more troublingly, disabling any of these animations didn't seem to change the color in any way, so it's possible that these subfiles have nothing to do with that. I honestly don't know. I can't say anything with confidence here, so if you're going to make any changes here, make sure you know what you're doing. Also, the particle and effects files present in the 1.00 version of the common.carg are slightly different from the ones in the 1.01 version, and what's better is that trying to edit some of them will cause Brawl Creek to crash too! So, you know, that's just even better. Honestly, I would advise you to stick away from changing much in this file unless you are 100% confident in what you are doing. Oh, and did I forget to mention that you should definitely read this page first? And with that, we have finished talking about the common.carc file. Whew, this one was quite a long one. The common.carc does deserve the detailed look though, as it is the main file that will change most of the elements of the game. You should now have a good understanding of the elements that are present in the common.carc file and how you can go about modding them. Also, if you have any extra comments, questions, concerns, anything like that about the common.carc, please don't hesitate to post a comment below and I'll see what I can do. Now, fortunately, the next episode shouldn't be as long as it will be talking about a more narrow and straightforward part of the tank's modding process. In the next video, I'll be going into detail about the file that deals with GUI and language elements in the tank's minigame, the local.carc file. For now, Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you all next time. Adios!